morning. Good morning. Welcome to welcome to Richmond. We're here for a very exciting announcement today on uh, um, methane capture from one of Virginia's uh, uh, best corporate citizens. CNX Gas is a six billion dollar energy development company that is doing considerable business in the Appalachian region of Virginia. Um, it's a company that has experienced tremendous growth, uh, truly tremendous growth, in just a few years. Um, Nick, De Nick Deulius is the president and CEO of CNX Gas, and I know that he and his staff have been following the Governor's uh, Climate Change Commission and the Governor's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Goal for quite some time. They took a special note of the Governor's uh, uh, announced Greenhouse Gas Reduction Goal 30% by 2025, which was announced uh, last year. Uh, Nick began his career with uh, Consol Energy, um, <clears throat> which I believe is, uh, has the largest mining presence uh, in Virginia. He is both an engineer and a lawyer, which means he can figure out solutions very quickly and then very quickly immediately proceed to make them overly complicated. <laughs> but that said, better, better to laugh. <laughs> but that said, we're, we're very pleased to have Nick and his team here today. Um, uh, they are very committed to meeting not only Virginia's but the nation's energy needs, supply, uh, energy supply, um, and also working simultaneously to meet uh, greenhouse gas reductions. Nick. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. It's right around that time. Uh, first, I am Nick Deolius, as uh, previously mentioned. I work for CNX Gas, and I want to first thank Governor Kane uh, for giving us the opportunity uh, to be here today. It's certainly a huge opportunity for us at CNX Gas, and we'll talk about why we're so excited about the Governor's Energy Plan in a minute. We truly are. Uh, with regard to CNX Gas, if you're not familiar with us, we are publicly traded, natural gas producer, and we were spun out through an IPO from Consol Energy, the giant coal mining entity, about three years ago. And our specialty area historically has been one of extracting methane from coal seams, or what we call coal bed methane. So not a big surprise that we came from a coal company, that our area of expertise would be coal bed methane. And with regard uh, to what we do and the statistics that we track, the thing we're most proud of is our safety record. We haven't had a lost time accident within our employee base in 14 years uh, at the company. So that's saying something, especially in an industry like ours where people can get hurt, unfortunately, on a regular basis if you're not focused. So uh, safety is extremely important to us. Uh, with regard to uh, where we're at and where we're going, when we took a look at the governor's uh, energy plan, we got very excited. And the reason we got excited was for the first time we saw some leadership and the guts to move forward where it recognized that you need to link energy security and energy supply issues with environmental stewardship and climate change issues. Talking about one uh, without the other is flawed thinking, and it often leads to unintended consequences, and most of us know that unintended consequences usually end up being on the negative side. But when you look at energy security and energy supply, it goes hand in hand, it's joined at the hip with environmental issues. Uh, the governor's plan recognized that. There's a man who wants to have his cake and eat it too, and I think we're gonna be able to have uh, just that, that issue come out that way. It's not going to be easy, Linking these two is terribly challenging. It's a huge challenge, very complex, very big stakes, but I can't think of anything else that we would want to be involved with at CNX Gas other than playing a role uh, with regard to tackling that challenge. So we definitely are encouraged uh, by that leadership that the governor has shown. Now, why and how does CNX Gas play into the governor's energy plan? Why are we here today? Well, there's really two reasons when you come down to it. The first one is more of a macro issue. We're the largest gas producer in the Commonwealth. We employ over a thousand employees uh, through the employee base and contractor base in southwestern Virginia. And we're investing 170 million dollars in capital this year alone in southwestern Virginia. So being a big player in the Commonwealth means that we should play a big proactive role in helping the governor execute on this energy plan. But the second reason we're here and how we fit into this uh, today is really more specific, more surgical. And that's with regard to what we do with regard to mine capture. Uh, methane mine capture. We are the largest capture of methane in the energy space today. And this largely evolves from what we do with regard to our activities of active coal mining operations of Consol Energy. So historically, Consol wanted to get methane out of those coal seams uh, before, during, and after mining to reduce explosion hazards and improve safety. And that was vented to the atmosphere. And many of you know methane is over 20 times the greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide is. So not the best, perhaps, from an environmental standpoint, but there were safety issues that drove that 
that decision making in those activities. We come along, we start to collect that and process that, and now we've got another saleable byproduct in addition to coal, which is natural gas or the methane that we're collecting. So here you go, a perfect illustration of what the governor's after. Increased energy supply, increased energy security through the additional natural gas production. At the same time, because that's being used in power plants to generate electricity and being used in homes for heating in the winter season, a reduced carbon footprint, we're emitting CO2 instead of methane, where CO2 is less than 120th the uh, greenhouse gas that uh, methane is. So again, both sides of the, uh, the table being met just with the, uh, the governor's energy plan and vision. So again, I want to thank the, uh, the governor. I want to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, we look forward to this opportunity. I'm going to turn it over next uh, to Dr. Richard Sandor, who is the chairman and CEO of the Chicago Climate Exchange. He plays a critical role in all this. He's a critical link in this chain as to why we're here today. Because he basically created the platform market-wise that allows all these activities and all these companies to come together and be optimized where you see an increased energy security and reduced carbon footprint improved environmental stewardship. Absolutely critical. So when I look at Dr. Sandor, I look at Governor Kane, I see a great example of collaboration between the public and private sector. It's just that collaboration we need to once again address that very huge, very complex, and high stakes challenge that we've got in front of us. With that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Dr. Sandor. Thank you. Nick, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with all of you today in Virginia. I will explain just a little bit about our enterprise and who we are and what we do. I'm executive chairman of a company called Climate Exchange, which is a publicly traded company on the AIM division of the London Stock Exchange. We own the European Climate Exchange, which implements the Kyoto Protocol and the 27 members of the EU. And that particular exchange is trading $300, $400 million a day of carbon, and this past Friday traded a billion too. There's nine exchanges, we have about a 90% market share. In the United States, the progenitor was the Chicago Climate Exchange. It began, as I was indicating to the governor, on less than auspicious uh, circumstances. Uh, we got a grant, uh, and that grant, by the way, a member of the board who pushed it was a man by the name of Barack Obama in 1999 to explore market-based solutions to environmental problems. We got the grant. The administration pulled out of Kyoto. That was followed by 9-11, the Afghan war, Enron imploding, the stock market crashing, a war in Iraq, and a deep recession. Um, and out of that auspicious beginning, we exhausted our foundation funds, we exhausted friends and family's money, and ultimately, our first outside investor with the Jesuits who thought that it was a good idea to put your heart and mind with capital, and they weren't in Congress. I'm happy to tell you that's the kind of investor you don't want to disappoint because his client's pretty important. Uh, but Father Francis uh, came up with a million and a half dollars, put uh, money in the stock at a pound a share, and I think we're trading at 18 pounds today, so he's done very, very well. That beginning has led us to a, a legally binding but voluntary program. And over the past four years, we have developed an exchange with 550 million tons. 16% of the United States participates as members, all done because they see the social value of creating financial incentives to address problems of the environment. The members of the exchange uh, include 17% of the Dow Jones, IBM, DuPont, Intel, United Technologies, and Bank of America as an emitter. 11% of the Fortune Top 100, Ford Motor Company, uh, Abbott Labs, Safeway, International Paper, etc. 20% of the top power companies, including American Electric Power, DTE, 
TECO, Allegheny, NRG, many of our members have operations in Virginia and it is a very important locale, particularly with the governor's leadership. Most importantly, we also run a, uh, a futures exchange and trade 80 to 90% of SO2 emissions, traded about seven billion of those last year, on Knox market and numerous others. On Friday, we started a market in Canada for the Canadian Climate Exchange and a joint venture with the Toronto Stock Exchange. And we just signed a memorandum of understanding with PetroChina to explore emissions trading in China. We have five Chinese members, five Indian members. We have two states, New Mexico and Illinois, eight cities from Chicago to Melbourne. The House of Representatives has gone carbon neutral, hits a member, etc. Of all of those things, I'm as proud as I can get to, to stand by these two gentlemen because CNX has taken an incredible step, a coal mine company that is showing that you can, in fact, do good and do well. Okay, the shareholders will benefit, my kids and grandkids will benefit. We're talking about taking 8 million tons of methane out of the air, as Nick indicated, that's a million cars off the road, and there's more coming. And to take that revolutionary lead is giant. I've been working on this since 1991, and it really takes a special type of company to marry social objectives and markets, and to recognize that the two are not compatible. So, and I think this fits in with the governor. It fits in with the preservation, the 400,000 acres. It fits into not only creating the state's venue of an economic leader, but also an environmental leader. So it's a personal privilege to be here to congratulate both of these men for their leadership and for taking some very, very bold steps where others have not. And it's very important to realize carbon trading, emissions trading, is not a thing of tomorrow. It's a thing of yesterday and today. And there's a leadership here that will hopefully propel it further. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Sander. This is this is fascinating. This is complicated stuff, but but it is um, an issue of the greatest urgency. And I'm so proud to be in Virginia and stand here today with Dr. Sander and Nick Deulius to talk about something truly transformative. It begins with this: our nation doesn't have an energy policy. We don't have an energy policy at the national level. Other nations in the world do. Other nations in the world, as a matter of public policy, are pushing the various goals that need to be balanced if we're going to have a, uh, a secure future, but our country is not. But the absence of a national energy policy is not going to slow us down in Virginia, and it's not slowing many governors down. We're embracing the notion that we've got to be about this to do right ourselves, but also there is a sense among governors that if we push, we will be part of the reason why the federal government will eventually decide to embrace the appropriate energy goals. In Virginia, the energy plan produced for the first time under my governorship, and I give, I give uh, praise to my legislature. The legislature said, Virginia needs an energy plan, Governor, create one. And so for 16 months, we pulled together stakeholders from around the Commonwealth, and we created an energy plan for our future that tries to balance four goals that are all very important, that can be contradictory at times, but that we have to try to find this point of equilibrium between them. We have to have reliable and relatively low cost energy. The reliability of our energy supply and relatively low cost vis-a-vis -vis others will keep us competitive and will make lives easier for our citizens and for our businesses. We have to have our energy production be ever cleaner, getting cleaner and cleaner, cleaner all the time by pushing technological change and innovation, being willing to bet on investments in cleaner technology. We need to be secure. We need to have the greatest percent of our energy coming from our own shores and stop our over-reliance upon energy from others. It's an absolutely critical thing to the physical security of our nation that we not continue to send a billion and a half dollars a day to nations that hate us. There is no way, there is no way that 
our nation has ever been in a war before. If we had gotten into World War II in December of 1941, that our nation would have willingly gone to war but financed our enemies. And that's what we're doing in this country by the absence of an energy policy. So energy security and homegrown sources is critical. And the final goal is conservation. We have to work with businesses and individuals to find ways to reduce energy use. So those are the goals. Reliable and low cost, clean production, energy security, conservation. We have to keep those in balance. Our nation isn't doing it, but we're trying to do it in Virginia with the help of this energy plan and with the groups I have going for it. Standing here today with Nick Julius from CNX Gas and with uh, Dr. Sander is truly remarkable. Let me just focus on CNX Gas for a minute. And Sol Coal has the largest coal mining operations in Virginia, among other companies. And CNX Gas is the largest gas producer in Virginia. Nick and Dr. Sander mentioned this, but let me underline this. In the very recent past, just a few years ago, we were letting the methane that would build up in coal mines vent into the atmosphere. We would have to you know, flush it out of mines so that mining could be done safely. We were venting this into the atmosphere. Methane gas, 20 times worse for greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. We we're just putting it right into the atmosphere. Today, we are capturing that methane. By capturing the methane, what CNX does they do the equivalent of taking one million vehicles off the road every year by the methane that they're capturing, that they weren't capturing just 15 years ago. And so they're capturing the methane, which makes coal mining more safe for those who do the tough, tough work of being a coal miner. And they're capturing this methane, which is positive in terms of the, uh, the greenhouse gas problem. And they're using the methane to produce energy, energy on our shore so that we can reduce our over-reliance on foreign energy. This is a remarkable technology, an amazing success story. Hadn't got a lot of, you know, uh, you know public uh, uh, praise or attention, but this is a company doing this without a national energy policy. Imagine what our ingenuity of our country could do in this area if we had a, uh, an energy policy that would promote innovation like this. But CNX has stepped up and said, okay, we see an opportunity here, good for the environment, good for our shareholders, good for safety, we're going to make it happen. And, and Nick, I just really want to thank you guys for being such great leaders. It is a tremendous story that benefits our workers, benefits our climate, benefits our pocketbook, benefits our relations with other nations. To Dr. Sander on the, Chicago, on the climate exchange, I mean, this is also a truly uh, visionary approach. Dr. Sander's been named one of the heroes of the planet by Time Magazine because he has gone into, with his climate change operation, climate exchange operation into the nations of the world and found ways to trade, you know, CO2 offsets to help companies and institutions and even political bodies, the House of Representatives, attain carbon neutrality. Again, this has been done voluntarily without a national energy policy. Imagine how strong we could be if we had a national energy policy pushing these initiatives, putting dollars in for research and, and innovation. We're proud to be your guys' partner in innovation here in Virginia. We're going to push those four goals. We're going to push them in tandem with you and with others who take this issue seriously. You know, it used to be that, that it was hard to get people to take this issue seriously. When I ran for governor just two and a half years ago, the only energy question I got asked my entire campaign was a question about gas prices in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina when gas prices spiked up. What can you do about gas prices? Nothing about conservation, nothing about greenhouse gas, nothing about energy policy. Virginia didn't have an energy policy. Citizens weren't demanding it. The good news is just two and a half years later, there is a, an incredible hunger in this country for leadership on this issue. We'll try to be leaders at the state level, and we will do our very, very best, knowing that the more we push at the state level, the more likely we'll also push the federal government to finally take this issue seriously and accelerate even more of the innovations that both the climate exchange and CNX gas are able to do. With that, I want to say thanks. I want to thank Preston, who's been my point person on the 400,000 acres, on the current Climate Change Commission, on the Energy Plan, and Steve Waltz, the Energy Advisor for State Government, have done yeoman's work in this area. We are moving ahead in an innovative way using some market-based strategies because of the wisdom of these two gentlemen and others. With that, I want to take questions. Jennifer. I'm sorry, I didn't hear how long CNX has been doing this this capture of methane? How long have you been converting the capture into energy? We have been doing that uh, for a number of years, but we really got started in earnest with regard to that just before we were spun out from Consol Energy. And when you look at what we're doing today, there's more opportunity 
across the Consol Energy coal mines uh, outside of Virginia to do this very same thing, and especially in other uh, coal mine locations for third party coal operators. So and when, when were you spun out of Consol again? Summer of 1995, so it's just been over three years. Yes, please. What does it take for a company to enroll in the exchange, and then how does the exchange work? Uh, the uh, enrollment process uh, can take as little as uh, one to two months. The company basically agrees to take an emission reduction or to provide a renewable energy resource. It could be ag methane, soil sequestration, preservation of forests, rangeland management, hydro, all of those things. And those are the offset providers the people who are motivated to create the lower cost compliance tool for heavy industry until they can employ their own technologies, integrated gas combined cycle, changing from natural gas, etc. The company then, if the emitter emits a million tons a year, they promise to get it down to by 6% by 2010. So they have a baseline, we measure it, we monitor it, we independently audit it, we verify it just the way we make sure, and that's all done by a self-regulatory organization, FINRA, and engineering firms to make sure these things are being implemented so it's not an idle greenwashing thing. These are real tons that don't go into the atmosphere. For the emitting companies, like a Ford Motor Company, for example, or like AEP, if it was a million tons, the first year we only give them 990,000, 1% less than they emitted last year. The second year we only give them 980,000 credits, then 970, all the way down to 940. If at the end of the first year they have emitted not 990, but 900, they can sell those credits to other companies who haven't been able to comply cheaply. If alternatively, their emissions have gone up from 990,000 to over a million, they must buy some reductions, encourage some renewable energy resources to comply, so they must either cut them themselves or stimulate other people to cut them vis-a-vis -vis these offsets, and that's what they're called. So it's an allowance system, it's an offset system, and it basically incentivizes the cuts to occur in the cheapest possible way so as to generate employment, not to cause economic dislocation, and it's not complicated. There's thousands of little things that can be done, and a market price does that. And I'll, I'll finish with one last thing, because I, I do want to get one message across. It's price that, that is the key driver. While we trade these hundreds of uh, millions of dollars, it's the price signal. And most recently, Manu was named as Time Magazine top 100 people called us up he worked as a professor at MIT, he saw a price signal of $5 on the exchange. He said, if I cut 100 million tons, can I make $500 million? And I said, sure, professor, it just has to work. And that it ended up as a dream. He raised $3 million from somebody else. MIT, is, he takes an eight-acre pond, sprinkles algae on it. It does enhanced photosynthesis. Yeah, algae all, eats carbon. Algae eats carbon. It's like a sponge. It eats a hundred times more carbon. Sprinkles it on. He just sold it to MIT that's building a power plant based on the algae. Princeton University. And last year ended up creating biodiesel from this algae. All because he saw a signal of price that he could make money and innovate, and so it's a wonderful marriage of creativity, inventive activity like CNX, something that's good for the shareholder, and something that's good for the public. Please. Uh, 
this is really bad because Dr. Sanders. How does uh, your bills compare with the war Lieberman uh, legislation and uh, any other? I'm, I'm so proud of, of people like CNX, like Ford, like Intel, and like IBM. Our goals are actually, if you projected our reductions, they are as tough as the toughest bills of the floor of the Congress. They cut by 6%. They've only been required to cut by 4% by 06. They've cut by 12%, 180 million tons of industrial reductions, which, just to put it in perspective, all without the government's assistance, and, as the governor said, and that would be about equal to France and Belgium's emissions combined, all because the price and market is worth that. So it's tough standards, as tough as they get. Jennifer. Governor Payne, um, slightly off topic yep. question. Um, okay, can I say, are there other questions about this item first, and then I'll switch to you? We've got time for a little bit. Yeah, okay, Jennifer. Um, Today, Delegate Bill Janus has put out a memo saying that, that you are using the transportation special session as a vehicle to uh, forward your aspirations to become vice president, and that in his, in his measurement, you spent more time stumping for Senator Obama than promoting your transportation plan. Your response Well, I, I'm sure he has his own unique system of measurement that would only be known to him. Um, well, that, that's so disappointing. It's so disappointing when someone has an opportunity to be part of solving a problem, but instead wants to find an excuse to not solve a problem. And that's, and that's I guess, what he's doing. Did he give you a plan for solving a transportation problem? Is that a no? I, I didn't see that in the memo. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I became governor in January 2006, I didn't know who was going to be running for president in 2008. I put a plan on the table to solve the state's transportation problems that the House Republicans bottled up in a committee. Uh, in a regular session and two special sessions, I pushed for that plan with legislators. Uh, they, could, they would not agree to a transportation solution for the Commonwealth. Um, in 2007, they came together and actually did agree on a plan that they put on my desk. I worked with them on. Delegate Janice voted for the plan, I believe. Much of the plan has either been struck down by the courts or repealed. So I have proposed a plan six weeks ago or so for a special session relying on exactly the same revenue sources that Bill Janice and his colleagues voted on last year. I'm listening to these guys. I'm in dialogue with them. So the proposal I have on the table, I might have drafted it differently if it was just me trying to solve transportation. But I've drafted a plan that relies on the revenue sources that the House voted on 90 to 10, I think, last year to solve the problem. What have I heard? Oh, no, we're not going to do that. Fine. Where's your plan? Delegate Janus, Republican leadership, any members of the Where's your plan? What are you going to do? On nights and weekends, once a month since November, I have campaigned for Senator Obama. One weekend a month. I am entitled to a little bit of personal time. Last Friday night, I was, I really got lucky, actually. I was supposed to go to a debutante ball with Ann and some friends, and I was able to get an excuse and get out of it to go to Texas and campaign for Senator Obama, taking my family time. And if I want to take personal time because I care about the future of this nation, the need to have an energy policy, for example, the last thing I would expect would be somebody would saying that, you know, I shouldn't care about the future of the nation. So, no, I'm dealing with legislators every day, got meetings with legislators today. I'm doing my eighth of ten town hall meetings. I've done 20 town hall meetings. I've done, tonight will be the 18th town hall meeting that I've done since the legislature adjourned in March. Ten were about broad topics, including transportation. The eighth one tonight, I've done eight just about transportation. Bill Janice hadn't come to any of my town hall meetings. I've had legislators come and dialogue with me. I've had Republican legislators come because they want to hear the citizens and find out what to do. I've never seen him show up at a single one. So, you know, I guess I'm just, I'm just interested that people are interested in thinking who they can blame, finding reasons for inaction, trying to put off to tomorrow, you know, what they've put off year after year. It's the same thing that's got this nation in a problem on the energy policy. We have a legislative process that will not fundamentally address problems that matter to people in their homes and businesses. And transportation is one of those. And it's not going to get solved with a lot of people standing around trying to point fingers and figure out excuses for inaction. If he's got a better plan, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Please, please. 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 Please.
Just um, in, in your proposal, you've got uh, the lockbox and the double lockbox yep. proposal. Um, can I you uh, just tell us one more time why that lockbox is as important to you? It's truth in advertising. I mean, basically, it's simple. We are, if we're telling the citizens this revenue is going for transportation, there ought to be a guarantee that it is. So, in the proposal that I have, the bill, in each of the revenue sources, there will be a provision if the monies are ever used for anything other than this, the purposes specifically indicated here. Pure transportation, in the case of the regional packages, has to stay in the region, then the revenue source will immediately expire. Um, and that's to make sure that we are truly doing what we said we're doing. There was a practice before I was governor of occasionally using transportation revenues and taking them out and using them for something else. I stopped that as soon as I got in the office. We've not used transportation dollars for anything else, and we won't. But I think we need to get people a guarantor going forward. If we're going to do something, adjust the revenue source, say it's for transportation, they need to have a guarantee that it won't be used otherwise. All right, thank you all for being here. Thank you guys for your great work.